So, okay. So once more, I have restarted the video. Uh, welcome everyone to this Take Action webinar uh, for November 2019. Um, this month's focus is on reaching out and engaging organized labor and labor unions. And it is, I think, somewhat fitting that um, uh, this topic is being dealt with on this election day because we tend to think, do we not, that democracy, uh, too many of us, uh, sadly, um, believe that democracy begins and ends with voting and that all we need to do to bring about change is just to elect the right person or persons. And certainly that is a piece of what's needed. But to complement or supplement having better people, we need uh, to bring about change uh, through organizing uh, movements. That has been the history of this country. Successful social movements, democracy movements have brought about great change. And on the cutting edge of most of those movements participate, participant wise, have been uh, people who have uh, self-organized and been part of uh, labor unions or organized labor, as well as people of faith and students and others. But organized labor has certainly been an anchor in many of those uh, social movements that we have uh, witnessed and maybe that you have been a part of. So uh, with that, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, gathering. Let's see here if I can actually, we are. Um, hopefully everyone is hearing me speak. If not, or if not loud enough, uh, you may be able to turn up your computer or phone. Um, there is, depending on how you are, um, what kind of computer you have, either at the very top uh, or at the very bottom, there may be a um, little screen or a chart um, or a guide of different options, one of which is um, a question and answer. Um, and there's an opportunity uh, to hit the chat button that you may be able to see. Um, chat here. And so by hitting chat over here in the three dots, you can type in a question or comment here if uh, you're not able to raise your hand. And if you have any technical difficulties, uh, particularly hearing or being heard, type your concern or question using that chat uh, icon. Okay. Well, the agenda for this evening is as follows. We're going to have some very brief intros of the um, three of us who are facilitating uh, this um, webinar. Then we're going to have a very quick overview of Move to Amend, a description of the Labor Caucus and the campaign within Move to Amend, a background on organized labor, um, and then how to get started for individuals who really wish in their respective place, wherever you may be, to um, reach out. Uh, to engage them and to uh, figure out how best to collaborate uh, for mutual benefit because <laughs> we think we need one another to bring about the kind of change that is so required. And then a uh, period of questions and comments and uh, uh, the next steps that uh, I will be sharing with you uh, at the end, very end of uh, this gathering. So we try to make these uh, programs no more than 90 minutes, but less than that, hopefully this formal part of the presentation will be no longer than about a half hour. And if for whatever reason you need to get off uh, after that, if you are able to you know, ask your question or make a comment before doing so, please, uh, hopefully you will uh, have the time and patience to do that. So. Ah. Brief intros of uh, the three of us. Uh, each of us are connected to Move to Amend in some way. So if each of you could just very briefly say who you are, where you're from, and how you have some kind of connection to uh, working with labor. Linda? Sure, thank you, Greg. Um, I'm gonna mute myself when I'm not speaking because I have a bad cold, so I'll be coughing and sniffling here. Um, my name's Linda Jillison, and I work with the statewide group here in Montana called Montanans Move to Amend. Um, I grew up in a household where the parent who had the reliable job, which kept us going for many, many years, 
was a unionized elementary school teacher. My father was ill and really couldn't hold a yeah. good job. And from my mom's uh, union um, uh, union employment, we had the kind of security that we needed to have uh, to have a good life. Um, I uh, have been a, an instructor, a, a faculty member on a few university faculties over the years, and most recently on a unionized faculty at the University of Montana. And I came to appreciate even more than I had before uh, the benefits of having a union to back you if you have a problem, to advocate for you if your benefits are not sufficient or if your um, if your um, if your salary is not sufficient and so on. And one of the things I noticed was not only that uh, being part of that union, which is now part of the Montana Federation of Public Employees, benefit not in only those of us who were part of that local, but also other faculty members in our system. And, and we all know that that often happens with unions. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here. I work with uh, Lawrence and Greg on the um, Labor Caucus of Move to Amend, and we'll be talking about that a little later on. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Linda, and cold is uh, getting better even as we speak. Lawrence. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm a retired Teamsters from Local 70, Oakland, California, and I'm a seasonal political organizer with the uh, Alameda Labor Council. It's an AFL-CIO umbrella group that uh, helps uh, create labor solidarity in various regions throughout the country, and we have 130,000 uh, plus uh, union workers here in Alameda County. Um, and uh, we represent over 130 uh, unions. And um, I uh, was a Teamster for just about 40 years. And um, thanks to the Teamsters, I didn't know it at the time when I joined, I got a, a, a part-time job while I was going to college uh, working for United Parcel Service. They made me join the union and that actually started me on um, started my pension growing and out here in the west all the western states have uh, one pension contract and every teamster can jump between different jobs and their pension keeps growing and so that's really helped me um, do what i want to do and then also the um, afl cio with our um, council on political education our cope program we elect labor friendly um, candidates and then we hold them accountable and that's getting more and more difficult with big money in politics, which we'll discuss later. And that's really why uh, labor supports um, our efforts here with the House Joint Resolution 48. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lawrence. And um, I am Greg uh, Coleridge, even though my here says I'm Caitlin Saboki Belknap. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't changed that yet, but um, um, I'm the outreach director here at Move to Amend. You already, Greg. We knew I already. know. Uh, had been with Move to Men for a couple of years. Prior to that, worked for a Quaker-related organization, the American Friends Service Committee, which uh, for about 30 years worked with a variety of different organizations, including uh, labor very closely on a variety of different kinds of issue areas, including privatization or corporatization of uh, public services, uh, issues around trade, um, concerns about the federal budget, state budget, local budget, other concerns. I grew up in a labor household, being from Akron, Ohio, where the uh, United Rubber Workers was first started, my dad was very involved in some of that early organizing, including helping start Local Number Two in uh, Akron. So, grew up hearing about uh, the labor struggles uh, pretty early on, and some of the uh, quite uh, violent and nonviolent uh, antecedents of it, and the need for working people to self-organize to a counter uh, organize, which. Uh, uh, has been very effective in hijacking government and uh, the courts and every other instance, media and the like. So all the more important for us to be cognizant of the, the power and the necessity to work with people uh, in organized institutions. So with that uh, very brief background about Move to Mend uh, before we go on for individuals who may not be completely familiar with uh, who we are and what we do. Our mission is uh, very simple. Uh, we're a coalition of hundreds of organizations and now uh, up to 70,000 individuals committed to social and economic justice 
ending corporate rule and building a vibrant democracy that is uh, genuinely accountable to people, not corporate interests. Our goals really are twofold. One is to pass this uh, amendment that we helped shape and has been introduced in Congress now for three sessions, We the People Amendment, HJR 48, which makes clear that artificial entities do not have constitutional rights. Only people should be deemed people with inalienable rights um, as defined the Bill of Rights and that money is not speech, uh, protected First Amendment free speech. So that is the goal to pass this We the People Amendment through Congress. Uh, and second, uh, relatedly, is to provoke discussion and organizing about how to make real the promise of American democracy through constitutional renewal. We believe that uh, the We the People Amendment is a huge undertaking, but nevertheless, it is merely the first step that uh, I think more and more people are coming to understand that uh, the Constitution needs some major uh, amending, if not rewriting, and that uh, uh, part of our mission at Move to Amend is to use the We the People Amendment as a stepping stone to uh, work with others collaboratively in bringing about uh, further uh, constitutional renewal. Our principles are these. We feel it is extremely important uh, to work uh, in trying to address anti-oppression and to do so um, in working in solidarity uh, with others. Uh, this country has been uh, certainly from day one, uh, one that has uh, focused on uh, affirming the rights of a very small percentage of people early on, white male property owners, and it is only non-white male property owners who came together uh, in movement to drive themselves into the Constitution where they should have been all along. But the issue of injustice around a variety of oppressions remain, and it's important that we work in solidarity with uh, those groups that build power. Uh, we are committed to movement building, uh, dedicated to grassroots organizing from the bottom up, working with people on the ground. That's why we have affiliates. Uh, we need to certainly address things at the federal level, but certainly building power from the bottom up is extremely important. And well, is how just about every uh, uh, social change uh, movement has occurred. We're dedicated uh, every day to political education to get on the other side of the learning curve, if you will, to develop a literacy around uh, how corporate entities came to amass the kind of powers that they have, as well as money being defined as speech. How did that happen? And it's something that one just doesn't kind of get at the beginning, but has to constantly uh, be learning and uh, educating oneself and uh, others that we work with. And finally, but certainly not lastly, is a very strong commitment to political and economic. They're interdependent, um, but to be independent uh, of um, uh, the strings that come with uh, entities that certainly are very powerful, controlling, limiting, censoring um, through giving, not giving money. So that is why we feel to be politically independent, we have to be economically independent, which means we don't accept uh, and are not beholden to uh, funding from government, corporations, unions, um, big foundations, even super duper wealthy individuals. We rely on people at the grassroots, people like yourselves, those uh, 470,000 people who we work with. Um, very important. They go being politically and economically independent. And we feel that the change required is one that we can't afford to be timid or focusing just on half measures. But this We the People Amendment is far reaching, fundamental, and we think is absolutely essential, but is one that uh, the power elite at the moment is not really strongly behind. So it's all important to be uh, independent uh, economically, so be independent politically. Amending the Constitution, as people may know, uh, really takes two forms. We can do it through the congressional route, which requires two thirds of both the House and the Senate to pass an amendment resolution. And then that has to be uh, ratified by three fourths of states, which number 38 through simple majority of um, uh, state legislatures. Uh, all the other 27 amendments here to four have, a, but there is this other way in the Article 5 of the Constitution through the Constitutional Convention route. None of this is uh, any of the amendments. 
century forward, including the 17th Amendment, direct election of senators, and several others. So the threat of having a constitutional convention has been enough to uh, get uh, Congress to take action in ways that they may not have done otherwise. And so that threat, if not actuality, requires two thirds of state legislatures to call for a convention to propose an amendment and then three fourths of the states must ratify that. So we are not at the moment calling for a constitutional convention. We're still trying to go the congressional route, but we are not uh, totally um, uh, saying we will never call for the convention if uh, we are uh, completely stymied through uh, Congress. Our strategy is uh, fourfold. Uh, bottom line is we focus on the uh, public to build a movement for power to pressure Congress to pass the amendment. That's who our focus is, bottom line. It's not so much on Congress, on the Supreme Court, on the corporate bad apples, on the media. It's we're focusing on us, on people, because we've got to, again, educate, activate, inspire, and uh, help organize uh, to build a movement. We focus on grassroots organizing to pass local and state resolutions, calling for our amendment. You know, they say all politics is local. And uh, so doing these local resolutions and ballot initiatives, yes, they're symbolic, but they build uh, education. They uh, create um, ways for people to develop uh, skills and abilities to organize, they build confidence. And you get to know if particularly at the re resolution route, you get to know your local public officials and get access to them. And we know that the federal public officials today, our Congress people were your state public officials yesterday and the day before that were your mayors and uh, local council people. So it's very important that we engage with people at the local and state level now because they are likely to be, relatively speaking, the state and federal people tomorrow. And so we organize and we just don't uh, do activism because activism can just be one off events that don't really build or, or uh, add up to anything. We're focused on coalition building. We reach out to other organizations working on issues affected by corporate power, including labor, which is why we're focusing this evening on that very important constituency. And our goal is to build a very broad and very diverse, multiracial and intergenerational. It's the only way we're gonna build sufficient power to have this kind of legit democracy movement, reaching out to those most affected by corporate rule and lack of authentic self-determination. Our structure in trying to accomplish this is we have affiliates, uh, more than 50 of them all across the country. You can go to our webpage and find out where those are. We have working groups. These are not so other issues, and they sort of adopt Move to Mend as maybe one of their projects. And so they, uh, uh, you know, weave in and out and engage with us when there's something extremely important and activity going on. Nationally, we have a board and a small staff, but uh, uh, we may be overworked, but uh, very competent and efficient. We have various national um, uh, committees, um, a couple of them that I'm involved in, Law and Research, and uh, a couple of others that exist in terms of dealing with media and uh, political engagement. And then we have these, what we call issue or sector caucuses. One of them, these are groupings uh, made up of individuals from the national level, as well as people um, at the local level, uh, like yourselves, uh, who work in trying to specifically reach out to various constituencies, labor being one, people of faith being a second, arts uh, and culture being a third, you know, artists that have played a very important role in students, educators, and the fifth is the newly formed next generation youth. So we have those five constituency groups that we have caucuses that are built around. So that's our structure. Ah, okay, Linda, you're on. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. And I think if people know even a little bit about the labor movement, they'll uh, see why we in Move to Amend believe that the alliance between um, organized labor and uh, move to amend is uh, really a natural and why those of us on the uh, on the labor caucus are really trying to work to make this a richer collaboration. Um, what you have on these slides are just a couple of um, characteristic and important quotes about uh, organized labor, particularly in the United States. 
And we, um, and we have um, chosen these uh, because they seem to be particularly um, appropriate to work with Move to Amend. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. Um, and this focuses on the historically verifiable um, uh, and demonstrable um, work which the labor movement as an organized movement has able been able to do and has been able to effect which really has caused uh, and brought about um, much greater uh, happiness and um, improved conditions for working people around the world and particularly in the United States. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're trying to do as well. We want to make democracy work for people. We want to bring people into the new democracy. Uh, and we want to be certain that um, for all of us, democracy is a living movement. Um, this next quotation, which we have, is from Richard Trumka. Possibly you know his name less well than um, MLK's name. He's the current president of the AFL-CIO. And he said recently, there is nothing stronger than the American labor movement. United, we cannot and we will not be turned aside. We'll work for it, sisters and brothers. And the reason I think this is an important quote is that it focuses on the kind of solidarity which Greg just talked about as one of the principles and values of uh, move to amend. That, that is, we work with various groups, with anyone who's interested in working with us in an attempt to make our democracy healthier, in an attempt to make certain that we all live together in a society in which we all have equal rights and privileges. Um, and um, so this is important. It's also important that we acknowledge that this is, this is a work. This is a hard job. As Greg mentioned, we're not Pollyannas. We know that um, amending the Constitution is going to take a lot of work by all of us. Um, and we really think um, that um, if we all work together, we can get this thing done. So, OK, Dave, um, Greg, next. Greg? Greg, I've lost the video. We may have lost Greg also. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I think so. Lawrence, I could hear you, but I yeah. can't see the video, and I can't hear Greg. Yeah, we probably all have the same thing on our screen. Probably so. Greg may have just come back. I just heard that little thing. Oh, yes. Are you there, Greg? Yes, I don't, I don't know what happened. Okay, Lawrence and I lost you and the video. Okay, so we need both of you back. Greg might be having trouble with his uh, computer freezing up or dropping, uh, dropping yeah. it because he had to, um, you know, log back in and then it looks like he logged in for a second and then we lost him again. No, I'm here. Oh, fantastic. There you are. Good. Let me just get back here. I cannot believe what happened. Welcome to technology. Unbelievable. All right. Well, here hopefully we... everybody on the call can be patient, and then we can make this work by, by editing it later. <laughs> yes. Um, share. While you're doing that, Greg, I can mention that somebody in the comment section, um, uh, in the chat section, uh, mentioned that they feel like we shouldn't be quoting Richard Trumka, that uh, we should be more enlightened than that. But, but you know, uh -huh. even uh, even mainstream labor unions um, say wise things every now and then. So, yeah. <laughs> right. but I, I understand their sentiment. 
Uh, right. And um, gosh, uh, yeah, organizations have good uh, good leaders right. and bad leaders and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. well, apologies to everyone for whatever occurred. Not sure what happened. Probably gremlins. All right. Okay. Are so, you, yeah. So are I you ready think to move on? Focused, yeah. Yeah. Ready to move on, Greg. Okay. Uh, to a little bit more thought about why, about why focus on the labor movement. Um, first of all, probably most of you are aware that uh, for many years, participation in organized labor. Whoops. Back one, Greg. There we go. There we are. Uh, participation in organized labor was a training ground for citizen participation for many, many workers. Uh, they would go to their meetings, they would be told maybe how to vote, but certainly that they needed to vote, that they needed to talk to their fellow workers about what their concerns were and so on and so forth. Um, and we think of Move to Amend as in some ways uh, that same kind of training ground, uh, that's what organizing is about after all, is helping our fellow citizens learn how to advocate for their own self-interest and then to broaden that view of what their self-interest is until it begins to take in a broader horizon of folks and of concerns. Um, so this is one thing which is important about the labor movement. and possibly something that we've lost in some recent years from the labor movement, but is, I believe, coming back. Uh, secondly, as Greg mentioned before, um, labor has been um, the main societal institution to counteract organized capital. That's actually, of course, why labor was formed, uh, namely to counteract the, uh, the uh, uh, pressures of organized capital and the interest of or organized capital, we can think of those as corporations, uh, by focusing on the welfare of working people instead. Thirdly, um, uh, labor, organized labor has been involved in many, if not most, historical social movements which have taken place in this country. Um, Again, labor tends to have people power. They sometimes have money power. They tend to have a good bit less of that than corporations these days. But labor relies on people power, actually. And again, that's what uh, we rely on in Move to Amend is, God knows, not money power, but people power. And again, the focus is on the welfare of working people. Uh, just to remind you that nowadays the working class is really not mostly white working class men. Uh, it's made up of a very diverse group of people. Um, and um, so we have all of those people's welfare in mind as we try to work with Move to Amend. We see that labor has always focused on those people and, um, and that we are interested in trying as labor has to improve the way things work for them. Okay, Greg, next slide. <coughs> Can we get the next slide, Greg? Yeah, can't you see it? No, uh, oh yes, there we are, okay. Uh, right, and this is just our goal as we've established it. This comes out on all of our minutes and all of our agendas and so on. The goal of the Labor Caucus is to support move to amend local leaders in all of their educational and organizing efforts, especially securing organized labor support of the We the People Amendment. So if you work in labor, or if you're just dedicated to labor, if you're in any way interested in labor and in move to amend and how we work together, we would ask you to uh, join in our labor caucus calls which happen on the fourth Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific time and last just an hour. And during those calls, one of the things we have always on the agenda is a question about how we of the caucus or we have moved to, met, to amend can be helpful to affiliates or to individual um, members who are trying to work with labor in their own neighborhoods or in their own area. So uh, it's one of the reasons for one of the um, 
intense we'll talk about in a second, and that is we really would like to diversify the Labor Caucus so that we can have as much help as possible available to those of our Move to Amend folks who would like to uh, nurture the alliance with organized labor. Uh, so you see down at the bottom of this slide the uh, link. Uh, you can uh, just go online to this and you can read all about the Labor Caucus and there's a sign in place there. So if you wanna sign in for the Labor Caucus, you can do so there. Okay, let's have the next slide. And you don't have to be a member of uh, oh, no. or connected to an affiliate to be part of the Labor Caucus. Exactly, that's true, Greg. And uh, people just can call in. There's really not a, a you know, private PIN number or anything like that. You can just be anybody who um, finds out about the caucus and is interested in working with and working for organized labor. Uh, just phone up. We never know exactly who's gonna be there on a Wednesday. Um, so um, life is always interesting in that regard, but you don't have to be a member of an affiliate a working group or anything. If you come upon the Labor Caucus, we're happy to have you on our calls. Um, okay, um, as far as our campaign to collaborate with labor, we feel that grassroots is, as in everything else we do in Move to Amend, uh, the best way we can work with organized labor. And local leaders who work at the grassroots uh, doing that kind of work really can do the most important work to build relationships between Move to Amend and the labor movement. Um, really grassroots work is, as Greg said, where we are. We're not working on state legislatures to try to get them to come up with, a, with a, an amendment. We're actually working with regular people to put pressure on our own um, representatives and senators uh, to do what we think they should do in order to uh, deal with the awful problems of corporate rule these days. So grassroots work is where we begin, uh, just as organized labor begins with grassroots. And we really would love to have some of you who would like to be local leaders and local leaders don't have to be elected. They just show up to do the work uh, we would love to have you working with us to uh, ally with organized labor. Um, we also believe that relationships are really where it's at. Uh, we can't just uh, step in and change things immediately. This is a matter of spending time with people who are moved to amend types and labor types and sometimes both, uh, as Lawrence is for sure. and. Um, we need to build relationships of trust and confidence with each other. And we begin that way to change our cultures and we expand the interests. We begin with self-interest, just as you would as a labor organizer. What's the worker's self-interest? And then we try to expand it to an interest in solidarity with more people. So uh, relationships and grassroots work are just where it's at for move to amend and um, in every other um, connection as well as with organized labor. Okay, Greg, next. All right, so our 2020 goals, our goals for this coming year on the MTA campaign to collaborate with labor. We would like to have amongst the affiliates who are out there, and some of you may be members of affiliates, five additional affiliates commit to prioritizing the outreach to labor. We know you have your own priorities already. We feel that the outreach to labor fits right in there with the solidarity and with the working against oppression and so on and so forth. And we'd really love to talk to uh, people in additional affiliates to see whether five of you would be willing to commit for the coming year to work hard to outreach to labor. Um, one of our goals as a labor caucus is to make a certain number, I think 15 presentations to labor related groups, whether they're conventions, locals, uh, informal groups or whatever uh, during 2020. And from all of us, since we hope to get extra support from this 
um, webinar, we would like to shoot for 25 such presentations. Again, you don't have to speak at AFL-CIO. You can just go and meet with members of a regular labor group um, uh, in your own neighborhood. And we would also like to work toward 12 additional endorsements by labor groups during 2020. Um, uh, right up there at the top with those other more specific endorsements is a real desire that we have to increase the diversity and the size of our caucus. Um, that means that we would like a representative from newly committed affiliates to join in the caucus on a regular basis. Uh, there are always things to be done in the caucus and it's a great group of people who get together and compare activities and um, concerns and get advice from each other. Um, and we would like for more people from across the country to be involved there. Um, and we've put here in blue just to say how important this is because it does again represent the solidarity uh, value and principle of move to amend. And that is that we want to focus on outreach to unions, especially which represent low income workers like SEIU, Unite Here, home care workers, adjunct faculty. Here, I think the matter of graduate student, uh, graduate um, assistant faculty um, was just in the news a couple of days ago. Um, so again, this is a matter of the solidarity with folks who do not have very much power, um, folks who are workers, folks who are of a very diverse bunch amongst themselves. And we feel that uh, we can learn a lot from them and uh, we can help them and they can probably assist us as well. So these are our goals for 2020. And I think next, um, Lawrence is going to talk. Oh, no, I've got one more thing just to point out on the next slide. And this is not a complete list. These are just sort of the larger units um, which are already supporting Move to Amend. Some of these have just said we would like to be named an endorsing unit. Some of them have asked to uh, support a resolution, which takes a little bit more work from uh, the, uh, the group that's joining up with Move to Amend in this work. Uh, but you'll see that labor already realizes that our means are much the same, our interests are much the same, our goals are much the same, and we have good strong support from lots of labor unions, um, and we would like to have more. We work on that all the time in the caucus, and we would love to have your help doing it. And I think now I'm going to turn it over to you, Lawrence. Lawrence is in labor up to his eyeballs as far as his work goes. So, labor, take it away and talk. Uh, Lawrence, take it away and talk to us about labor. Thank you, Linda. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I've already uh, misspoke a little bit earlier. I said that um, you know money in politics is why uh, why um, labor needs um, move to amend. But of course, I meant that's just one of the reasons why, and that's everybody that knows about Move to Amend, that we go way beyond um, money and politics when we're trying to end um, unjust constitutional rights of these organizations, uh, especially corporations. So some labor basics. Labor is not a monolith. That's really important to realize. Um, based on the capacity of your group, of your affiliate group, um, labor may not even be something you want to go after you know it's a it's always worth trying but um because some of the labor groups are in very right-wing places and in those areas they may only represent very corrupt industries and we live in a very corrupt time uh, in certain places where oil rules um you know it's going to be uh, like banging your head against the wall in other areas they're likely to be really progressive but the key is you don't know till you try so Labor is as diverse as, as people are, as diverse as jobs are, and it's really important to recognize that. Another thing to recognize is the times we live in. We live in incredibly corrupt times, and that's why we all do this work. We want to end the corruption, and we want to create uh, really system change to um, a fair system uh, where we the people really do uh, rule. So 
um, in this time, that's when labor has a massive amount of power. So that's another reason why it's always worth to tr uh, try to go after labor. Um, they really are one of the pillars of society that controls, still controls a lot of people power. And so they're a natural ally for us. So um, the 2020 elections, there's opportunities and challenges. The opportunities are that we can elect um, in many areas, like in the, in the Bay Area, we still have close to 30% uh, union density which is of course much higher than the rest of the country. And we try to elect labor friendly candidates that are also very progressive and very community friendly. And we work really closely with community groups. Um, the challenges are that a lot of these unions are going to be uh, very much preoccupied with, um, with electioneering and they're always preoccupied. So uh, unions are stretched to the limit. I don't know if everybody knows uh, the talking points that we're trying to create for labor, and that is that labor is working people standing together. Another way to think of unions is a power balance, a balance of power with your employer. Um, but to, to try to achieve the goals of labor, uh, it's really challenging in this corrupt world we live in. So, um, so during election time, it's even more challenging. Uh, before you call for, uh, do a little homework, um, luck, hopefully you'll run into some folks as you're doing outreach. Hopefully every affiliate has found ways to do outreach and you'll run in naturally run into uh, union members. Some of them will be more active in their unions and that's a great way to come uh, to find people that can give you an in. Otherwise just go you know search for uh, your local unions on websites and um, and um, hopefully you'll find an office nearby be alert to local news reports about strikes. Uh, and then always, whenever you can, that's a really great way to build these relationships with your local unions is to support them. So we want things to be mutual um, when you're building a movement. And the best way to show labor that you care about labor is to support them in strikes. They never forget. No one ever forgets when somebody goes out of their way to help you, especially when their food and income and their family is on the line. So that's a really great way. Contract talks is a good time. You'll learn about that in your local newspapers. And then the kind of workplace that the union represents, know what kind of uh, jobs are in your area, and then what those people are all about, because unions tend to have uh, um, you know, people that you can relate to based on uh, where they're coming from. Next slide, please, Greg. So some labor basics, union concentration is, uh, was uh, much higher in the Bay Area than 35%. Now we're down to 35%. So it really depends on what part of the country you're in and of course what part of the world. Labor laws in the US are far more restrictive than other industrial countries and just what you would expect from corporate rule, right? Just from a corrupt system, they're constantly trying to put labor down uh, in industrial, um, uh, well, industry in general really uh, doesn't really care for organized people, right? And um, that's what we're trying to create is organized people. Next slide, please, Greg. So union structure, you've got your international unions at the top. They're uh, a real tough nut to crack in general. Um, so we're trying to do this more, more bottom up, more local. And that's what I'm doing right here in the Bay Area right now. We're trying to get a local resolution with our Alameda Labor Council. We just found out that we can't do that because of the AFL-CIO National. So we're doing a different kind of resolution where we're petitioning them and letting them know why our local Labor Council supports move to amend. That's our goal and Greg's gonna be coming here to help us with that soon. Um, we have uh, regional bodies, uh, state bodies, bodies within, within a state and our, our local unions. So my Teamsters Union, for example, I'm Teamsters Local 70 in Oakland. We have Joint Council 7, which represents parts of Northern California all the way to the Central Valley. And we have a really great political branch within Joint Council 7. We have a political co coordinator, Doug Block, who you can follow on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, he's totally on board with us. He actually brought Prop 59 to our state house. So years of building relationships with the right people and the people that especially have political branch can yield really big and fast rewards uh, when you need them. So it's, it's, it's really always worth trying to reach out 
to uh, to your unions. Next slide, please, Greg. Labor coalition structures. So the state AFL uh, CIO in California is Cal Labor Fed. They're based in Sacramento, and that's where we got our um, statewide uh, labor endorsement for for um, uh, our proposition that. Um, basically stated that all of the citizens in the state of California demand that um, their elected officials do everything when they, within their constitutional authority to overturn Citizens United and establish that a corporation is not a person and that money is not speech. So that will be the state level, but you can just go down the line and see all the different um, local uh, levels and structure of labor. Next slide, please, Greg. Just before we... Um, please do. Yeah. I think what this slide shows, as opposed to the previous one, oops, we can go back. You know, this shows within a particular union, let's say UAW. So there's the international UAW, and then there's would be sort of a regional one or a state one, depending, again, depending on the union, they're so different. Uh, and then uh, within a state, there can be obviously divided up by county or multiple counties and then the local. So it's sort of a, a, a vertical structure within individual unions. But then this slide shows all the other uh, kind of horizontal type labor organizations that any one of these can contain representatives of many different unions that are mentioned. Political action committees or labor health care. And there's all these new kinds of groupings with labor connecting with other sorts of organizations because they realize they don't have enough power themselves. So they're forced to connect with others. And so connecting with some of these groups, you can get in and in one meeting have representatives of a lot of different type locals. Yeah, so stay on the slide for a second, Greg. Yeah. That's a really good point. So um, what we've done recently is we flipped a, a, a right wing Republican congressional district in the Central Valley of California and we worked with some of these other groups that also reach out to um, labor and the community and coalition. And we did um, phone banking and precinct walking. And um, that was a really good example. And all of the, uh, uh, almost all of the unions and definitely all of the labor councils uh, have really understood what Greg just explained that, um, that they can't do it alone. So actually when you're knocking on labor's door or you're helping them with a strike or you're helping them with uh, campaigning for a progressive candidate, you're really, they're hoping for somebody like you. And at the same time, then once we start, uh, you know, getting our ins with labor so we can give a presentation or finding the right people that already understand what we know so that we can start to build that movement um, within labor. Thank you, Greg. Next slide. Oh, sorry, may I say oh, something? Please um, do. Lawrence? Um, <laughs> please yeah, do. just back to that previous slide. Um, yeah. I think the reason we, we put in this business about the organizational structure in the mm -hmm. previous slide was because um, uh, for those of us who aren't deeply involved every day in labor, um, when we make contact with friends in labor unions, they're likely to use those kinds of comments, those kinds of terms for us. We may not know what a local is, or we may not know what a regional is, or we may not know whatever. And, um, and so that's the reason it's, it's not just a matter of knowing the theory of how they're arranged, but you may be advised by a member of a union, you need to talk to the regional secretary or whatever. So that's why it's important mm -hmm. to know how different unions are organized, not just for the theory of the thing, because, but because that's going to be your entree into talking to people in the union. Thanks so much. And you know, a lot of union members themselves may not really know their structure, but, um, but when, you're, when you're talking to somebody and you're, you're trying to get your foot in the door, they'll usually refer you to the right person. And then just ah. ask a lot of questions and they'll explain their structure because um, probably the best person you can talk to in any union who really knows what's going on is the person that answers the phone. Uh, whoever the secretary is, they're, they're the main person you're going to get a hold of. You're not likely to get a hold of um, any of the uh, executive committee or even a delegate. But, um, you know, the right person is the person you talk to when you call on the phone most of the time. 
and they'll know the structure. We were just saying, we were just saying that maybe a good place to start, you know, internally um, in our labor caucus, a good place to start in reaching out in your local community is this central labor council thing, which is the place in your community that would be like the Los Angeles labor council or Pittsburgh labor council where they meet once a month. It's kind of the local AFL-CIO, if you will, mm -hmm. that is a federation of a lot of different locals. And so you get an opportunity to speak there and you can get the eyes and ears of a lot of different key people. Mm -hmm. And on the Central Labor Council, they have the, um, their affili affiliated unions, which will be most of the unions in that region. So they can also uh, help you with directing you to all of their affiliated unions. But it's even better if you get your in with that Labor Council so that they can do outreach to all of their affiliated uh, labor unions once they're more on board. So the move to amend strategy for labor outreach, start with any labor contracts you, contacts you may know, because a lot of them already have the ends that you're hoping to create and the relationships that you're hoping to create. Because um, like any organizing, it's really all about relationships and there's no shortcuts, it takes time. Uh, if you can't find any, check uh, your existing move to amend labor uh, endorsers, your highest priority unions, you saw our list, and the um, contact uh, move to amend uh, for contact. So move to amend staff is really spread thin just as the, uh, the union um, employees are, but um, they're, they will help you. They know who our highest priority con uh, uh, unions are, and they often know of contacts that may be in your region because they've been building uh, these uh, relationships for quite a while. So the goal is to maximize education and outreach, uh, not just skip to leadership, um, and also remember our strategies to build a movement. So whenever we can um, schedule, I've got lucky enough to have my Teamsters on board really strong. And we've had two presentations right in our union hall um, in Oakland for Teamsters Local 70. Next slide, please. So the tried and true outreach principles, don't assume that your labor group has a coalition experience. Um, because labor is just now, they rec even though a lot of labor recognizes the need for coalitions and the need for um, the help of the community, um, they don't necessarily have a lot of experience in coalition building and they struggle with it just like we all do because um, there are so many different unions, say within a labor council and they all have competing and overlapping interests, sometimes they're fighting for the, uh, to organize the same uh, group of people. Practice active listening, and um, uh, that's just a good rule whenever you're uh, trying to build relationships. Always, they say always listen about uh, twice as much as you talk because you have, uh, or to help you remember, you have two ears and one mouth. Respect busy schedules. Um, union organizers are overworked and overwhelmed, really true. And uh, remember to be uh, patient and persistent, and I would really say incredibly persistent because once you're inside a, a, a labor council or inside a union, uh, because they're so uh, overextended, they've all gotten used to really being pesky and just staying on, uh, staying on your, uh, your efforts and don't giving up. And they actually appreciate that. So uh, you might think that they're blowing you off, but 90% of the time, I would say really 95% of the time or more, they are just overwhelmed. And by being persistent, you can get your foot in the door quite often. Next slide, please. And get started. Um, just familiarize yourself with Move to Amend's resources. Um, search uh, labor organizations in your city. Um, call first, be friendly with the secretary and be especially friendly with the secretary because she's overworked too. And she knows everything uh, to help you. So if you can get on her good side and same thing with her, you might have to call her back a few times, uh, but she'll be the one that really knows everything about their union, the right person to talk to, the most friendly person to talk to. So really have a chat with that secretary if you can. And if you can't, ask when you can call back to uh, talk to them for a moment. Ask to make a presentation at an upcoming meeting. Uh, knowing your union or group structure is key to know how to approach as is um, you know, getting that inf inside information, either from the secretary or for somebody who's already inside. Next slide, please. 
so the resources to help you on the website. And um, uh, I, again, it's really challenging. So uh, based on the capacity, you know, you'll get a good idea how much effort to put into this. But hopefully we've inspired you enough to make you want to reach out to labor and see what you can do in your area. So your, the introduction to organized labor for MTA volunteers, reasons why labor supports move to amend is really good um, to, especially to build a presentation um, where, where you can um, show that to union officials and union members. Model labor union or labor council resolutions in support of move to amend and the We the People Amendment. I uh, brought a big list of those, uh, a whole big stack of the model resolution with me to a Labor Day picnic and handed them out to lots of people. And all of a sudden, a postal workers union developed their own resolution in support of move to amend. And now they're passing it through the Labor Council. So those are really great. Uh, talking points for organized labor is another great handout. Uh, the labor wrap for outreach to organized labor, really great. And list of current endorsements from labor. They'll usually want that, but um, you know, we still would be doing this even if we didn't have any endorsements. So luckily the groundwork that's been happening and moved to amend for over 10 years has taken us pretty far so that now it's a lot easier to make inroads than it was in the past because we do have that big list of, of endorsements and, and growing fast. Next slide, please. Uh, so when you land a presentation, be ready to get only five minutes, and that can really happen because even if they tell you you have a half an hour, um, especially if you're dealing with uh, an executive secretary treasurer, um, they may uh, just have a few minutes, and then you may even have to reschedule. Just be flexible knowing that they're struggling. Uh, be sure you make a clear ask for an endorsement and resolution passage. Amend the resolution on the website. Um, as appropriate, you know, you might have to change a resolution multiple times, especially once you start dealing with a union or a labor council, um, because they, uh, they may, uh, uh, you know, not like certain words, uh, they may only be able to push their higher up so far. So, you know, you may have to be creative and always send that in advance to the decision makers. Um, bring copies to your meeting, bring brochures or top reasons why organized labor supports move to amend hand, bring all the handouts and, um, and then adapt it to how much time you have. Pass the MTA petition around when you start because we're always trying to grow our petition and grow um, people that may be in that group uh, of the presentation that uh, don't know too much about move to amend. And of course, by signing the petition, that gets them hooked up with our um, with our internal system. And then uh, send a thank you afterwards by email or mail. Those thank yous are really important. And, um, in relate and think of it, what you're doing as building a relationship. So don't feel like you're losing if things don't go the way you want. Think of it as the first step in building a relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, move to amend labor caucus. Are you a current or former retired member of the labor movement? Those uh, help a lot. I am, so I have, uh, being retired, I have a little bit more time. Um, Join the Move to Amend Labor Caucus. Um, and Greg, you want to take over from here? Sure. Just to say that we normally meet on the fourth, is it Wednesday? I can never remember of the month, but we are skipping this month, November, because of giving. So we are moving it to a week later. So the next call will be on uh, December the 4th at those times designated. Don't worry if you haven't copied any of this down because I will be sending out, uh, since everyone for this call had to register, I have your emails and we'll send out a follow-up email with links to all of those previously mentioned uh, uh, resources as well as uh, notice of the next meeting and some other information that's relevant. But you may wanna just jot down now if uh, you're interested in participating. And that's it. So, uh, appreciate you taking time to uh, uh, hear. If you have any questions or comments, I'm going to stop here, stop sharing, and invite any questions or comments you have. If you are able to provide a comment in the chat, 
that seems to be maybe the best way to do it. Do you want me to read it um, to you? Sure. Okay, so from David, it says, forget the old bureaucracy, uh, move to amend can hit four birds with one stone by uniting with union members and amending other forms of internal oppression in addition to the constitution itself. This is the time to compound impact while better positioned uh, change agents and emerging leaders are welcoming change through new ideas, evolved ecosystems and the redirection of funding. Hmm. So well, I, yeah, that, yeah he, he's talking about, um, you know, really make it grassroots, bottom up. And um, that I couldn't agree more. That's really important. And the neat thing about Move to Amend is since most of us are all volunteers, we can pretty much do where our passions take us and where our connections take us and our expertise and our, our skills and our background. So for me, it makes a little bit more, more sense for me to um, work with um, folks to try to get resolutions from labor councils and really push the AFL um, as sort of a possibility of a shortcut. But this note is really good. It's quite unlikely to change these big groups that are tend to be very conservative and stuck in the past. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in this that uh, the more grassroots we are, probably the more mileage we'll get. Go ahead, Greg. No, I was just going to say, it always makes sense to try to develop some synergy and, you know, hit uh, four birds with one stone, so to speak. And, <laughs> and part of what we do, even though we're focusing and have said quite a bit about starting at the local level and going up, you know, we sort of, in a sense, contradicted ourselves by saying, start with who you know at whatever level you know. And so for some of us, you know, some of us at the national level of move to men are trying to reach out to people at the national level uh, because we have some kind of contact there and using those kinds of contacts at the national level to try to get before national boards and uh, um, national assemblies to you get the amendment uh, passed and to use it as an organizing tool and an educational tool and, and an, an agitating tool to get people to um, build this movement. So we're trying to go at it from every angle we can, working with anybody we can, uh, wherever we can, who is involved in labor. And you know, that's pretty much a basic principle with every kind of group on every kind of issue. Though, obviously, to build power, you've got to have a base and a strong base. So our, our default and our bias certainly is toward trying to start at the local level and working particularly at that CLC where you can, by making one presentation, if you will, get many birds with one stone in and speak to many different groups who, and if you think about it at that CLC level, those are tend to be the more active people who are the representatives of their particular locals coming to that federation. And so if you can inspire them and activate them then they are more likely to go back to their local union to do something. Greg, may I say one more thing? Sure. Um, just the business about um, working from the bottom up and so on and so forth. And I, I didn't quite get everything that uh, Lawrence read from what David said, but uh, one of the things that we in Move to Amend feel about getting, um, uh, establishing a base is that once the constitutional amendment passes, let's say we pass the constitutional amendment, everything is not going to be over. There's going to be a whole lot more work to be done. And that work is not going to be able to be done, nor I think would we want it to be able to be done by just a high level cadre of individuals. Uh, we're going to need all the individuals that we can get together to pressure their Congress people and to work in every other way that a movement works. So David, yes, thank, I think I saw your, your uh, comment there for a second, but um, I do think uh, we all know that there'll be a lot of work just, I mean, one thing is that we say overturning Citizens United is not enough because corporations historically have 
asserted and been given by the Supreme Court so many other rights from amongst the rights of the Bill of Rights that we really need to have it stated that corporations do not have any of those inalienable human rights under the Constitution, which a natural person does. And, and so it's Citizens United is not enough. Even getting the, the amendment to say corporations do not have human rights and money is not protected speech is not enough because that just it takes us forward, but we've got a ton of work to do. And we in Move to Amend believe the only way we can do that is by having a base of grassroots people who are diverse and who are dedicated and who are willing to do the movement work that has to be done. Pass. Indeed. And Linda and Greg, um, David says he totally agrees with you. Yes, there will be more work. Thanks. Thanks, David. Yep. I see somebody raise their hand. I'm trying to get back to my... Uh screen to allow that person a bill, I think it is. If you can chat your question, Bill, while I try to find it too many screens on my desktop open. <laughs> Does anybody else see any other questions in the chat. Uh, I don't see anything after David, after David saying, yes, there will be more work that needs to be done. Um, but I guess if people have questions, they could put them in the chat and then we can deal with them. Yes, please do so. Or raise your hand so we can watch uh, Greg struggle here. <laughs> Oh, now, now, Lauren. Here we go. All right. Now, now, Here we go. I found it. Okay, good. Okay. Um, no? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> go so ahead, Bill. Can I be heard now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We hear you. All right. Uh, my question is a pretty brief one. Uh, what is the progress and what are the hopes for getting? the amendment introduced into the U.S. Senate? Mm. Good question. We have, as you I know... Have, find, who's, who was that who asked? Uh, Bill Harris. Bill Harris. From where? I live in Portland, Oregon. Portland. Okay, thanks. Great. Are you connected to the affiliate there? I have been. Our affiliate is... Oh, great. Not, 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 been rather, not been very dramatic lately after getting a state resolution and, a, mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. several, let's see, I think it's five cities and counties right. uh, with a resolution to request of our contingency in, uh, in the Congress to pass um, the amendment. Uh, we right. haven't had a whole lot to do except keep struggling to get at least one of our senators to introduce it to the Congress. Yeah, and one of your senators was one of our uh, leads for a while, Senator Merkley, and he sort of had give, given us a commitment that he would be the main sponsor, and then for whatever reason kind of backed down. So we have been um, <coughs> reaching out to probably a dozen other uh, senators who have been on our list of prospects, um, maybe the most um, opportunistic or that we feel the most hopeful about uh, are Senators um, Sanders and Markey from Vermont and Massachusetts. So have been in different stages of uh, uh, reaching out in a variety of conventional and creative ways to try to um, get them to make a commitment. Most recently, Senator Sanders at a town hall meeting in California publicly said he would introduce a an amendment to uh, end corporate constitutional rights and money of speech. And we are hoping that that specifically is ours, the We the People Amendment, since it is the most authentic. There are some others out there, but none of them that truly would do what uh, the rhetoric of ending corporate constitutional rights um, says. So uh, we're working on him. Uh, there's also been some uh, meetings and conversations with uh, Senator Markey in Massachusetts. We're hopeful that 
uh, by the end of this year, or early next year, we will have a uh, companion bill introduced in the Senate. I do see a couple of other uh, questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, one from uh, Taia. Is there any compelling objection that labor unions have expressed to decline supporting us? Um, Lawrence, want to take that one? Um, yeah, um, that's a really good question because um, we haven't, we found out that the AFL-CIO National uh, told us that they've, uh, they have a problem with the We the People Amendment, but we don't know what that problem is. And so I think it's probably um, has to do with what we're hearing from uh, other uh, organizations, nonprofit organizations, um, which unions are, and that is that uh, we already have these rights and that we don't want to take rights away. So uh, it's kind of neat that the, uh, the um, you know, the Orwellian effort here that created um, corporate personhood and money is speech um, they say, yeah, well, we threw you guys a bone too. You know, you guys are corporate people and you have the right to, uh, to spend money. So they've locked us into a game of corruption and wh whoever has the most money wins. And, you know, that's not a, a game that labor is likely to, to win because we have people power. Uh, we don't necessarily have uh, the most money. Although in California, we're sort of an exception to the rule. We do sort of uh, rule California with money. Uh, not we, but um, big, big organized labor tends to do that in Sacramento. Um, I'm guessing that that's what their problem is, but we have quite a few position papers on that that dispel that myth. Do you want to expand on that, Greg? Yeah, I, I would just say the two sort of oppositions I've heard, one general, one specific from labor, the general is, which is true with, as um, Lawrence says, of many nonprofits, is this sort of, what do you call it, general uh, fear of what is called unintended consequences. We just don't know what the impact will be. This is a radical change. It's a fundamental change. It's a dramatic change, which it is. And so the fear is, my gosh, what can happen? We just don't know. And so the fear of that unknown means people are willing to stick with the horrors of what is known. And the, the hardship and the destruction and the harms that are being caused to people, places, and the planet, which includes working people. Um, and all the issues we uh, are so closely connected with and working to change. That's sort of the general uh, concern labor has. The more specific has to do with feeling that they are going to lose absolute power that money gives them. You know, the We the People Amendment would abolish corporate constitutional rights of all corporate entities, for-profit, not-for-profit, and union uh, are entities. So to the extent that money is no longer being defined as speech would mean that corporate entities might not be able to wheel and deal uh, financially in the political, you know, quote unquote, political place. And so in one sense, if you look at this through the lens of sort of absolute power, it's true. They would not have as much power. They would not have as much money to spend in elections. But in terms of relative power, you know, what makes labor powerful is not the dollars they have in their treasuries. It's the people, their members, people power, not money power. So in relative terms, if corporate entities no longer have money power, yeah, labor no longer has money power, but that's not the source of their power. It's people power. So in relative terms, would have much more greater ability to shape and lobby and do public policy influence. But a lot of labor folks just can't see beyond the absolute power that they would absolutely lose, but not in relative terms. Any other questions? Anybody uh, had a quick question? <laughs> um, 
you know, the other thing about that, it should be said, you know, Lawrence mentioned that labor is not monolith and some labor unions are much more democratic. I mean, let's be, let's be mm -hmm. real. Some labor unions from the local to the federal are much more authentically inclusive democratic than others. Some are more sort of as maybe you've heard the term business unionism. Mm -hmm. They are much closer to almost mimicking the corporate model, very top down, very domineering, want the presidents and the people at that international level to be in control. And you know what? Political money gives people like that power, a certain amount of, of wheeling and dealing. And, you know, I'll give you some money, political candidate, if you give me something in return. And so it's a form of um, trading, horse trading helps them by having that, that trade of resource to gain maybe personally. And there have been certainly a you know, a decent amount of labor corruption. Now it's blown out of proportion and certainly people on the political right to use those incidents as examples to reduce the dwindling political power of labor and political rights of labor. But nevertheless, those instances do exist. And by reducing the to throw around money in, a, in the political sphere, it's going to mean that those individuals won't have the assets to maybe line their own pockets. So that is another reason why some labor folks are so against this measure. May I, may I say something? Sure. Um, right, I, I think that, um, and this probably has to do with differences amongst unions as well, but I can remember times in recent political life where a union, a national union has endorsed a candidate who was roundly criticized by a lot of the, of the rank and file. Um, and, and so it can happen that um, the leadership of national unions, this is maybe what you were saying, Greg, the leadership of national unions can be inside the beltway in the same way that politicians are inside the beltway. Um, and I think that the leadership changes. Uh, you know, some time ago, I found out that the AFL-CIO allegedly was on Reagan's side with the air traffic controllers back in 80-81. Uh, you know, so, and I confronted a, one of my organizer friends who said, yep, it was pretty bad leadership back then. So I think the thing is that no organization is perfect, and some of them tend to be more organized in a more um, demographic, democratic way, as Greg said. I do think there's that um, element of power which um, they feel needs to be protected. Power right. feel needs to be protected. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, yep. And there have been labor or democratic insurgency campaigns within certain unions. Uh, did, did the Teamsters, Lawrence, what was that, TDU? Yeah, um, they're still, the TDU is still alive and well, and so they're just another, it's an internal power struggle within the Teamsters, and uh, they've, they've gained quite a bit of traction over the years. They've been up and down, but uh, old school Teamsters is still pretty firmly in entrenched. Right, and so part of who obviously we're trying to reach out to in whatever labor group, labor union we come into contact with are those individuals who, like us, are dedicated to authentic, inclusive democracy. And those may or may not be people at the top or even in the middle, but more sort of at the sub-regional level or local level, rank and file. Yeah. Um, Greg Stack? Yep. Yeah, I'd just like to say too that based on my experience, um, when you first start dealing with these people, you don't, you know, just like building any relationship, you don't really know where they're coming from at first. And unions do a lot of weird things like, they, uh, they will tend to endorse whatever candidate that they endorsed in the past, unless that candidate does something really terrible and specific to hurt that, that union or that labor council. Even though a more progressive and better candidate comes along, they're sort of stuck with uh, protecting that old, old, old school uh, candidate. And they do the same thing in many areas within uh, the power structure of unions. They tend to um, and, and rightly so, do everything they can do to protect their members' interests, 
even though you might be really surprised once you do build relationships with these individual unionists or union leaders or delegates to the Labor Council, that they may be incredibly progressive and want to push their union in a different direction or a more progressive direction or uh, do a lot more. But um, they're, they're sort of trapped within their mission of protecting their workers, sometimes even, you know, uh, like to the detriment of destroying the planet, right? If you've got uh, uh, pipeline workers, the Teamsters represents pi pipeline workers, and I couldn't get them to try to go against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, so there are certain things they're just not going to do, even though many of their uh, leadership may wish to do it. So it's still worth building those relationships with the folks. And sometimes you can kind of find out how far they can go uh, in your direction. And they may wish to go in, in our direction. And it may just take uh, time, as Greg said, for a different leadership to come, to come in. And things are rapidly evolving right now. Everything's in flux. Everything's changing. Uh, we were the first uh, on the West Coast, the first Labor Council to have a climate justice group that we started a few years ago. We've accomplished amazing things. And now all the labor councils around us are forming um, climate justice movements. And within that, we're building a move to amend. So if we don't get move to amend in this round, it's coming. Right. Does anyone have any other questions or comments they'd like to make in the chat before we uh, break for the evening? Okay, well, if not, just want to thank you all again for taking your precious uh, evening uh, time uh, in your evening to be a part of this. Again, we will be sending out um, uh, some uh, follow-up material that was mentioned in the webinar, uh, as well as uh, some other information, as well as contact information for the three of us. If you wish to reach out to any of us, there will be information to do so. So don't hesitate, please, if you have any interest whatsoever in approaching uh, a union at whatever level, from local to regional, maybe you know somebody at the sort of the state level or even higher uh, or lower, depending on how you would look at it, uh, <laughs> please don't hesitate to reach out and um, contact us and we are here to help. And again, we will share with you information about the upcoming next um, uh, labor caucus call coming up in December. So thank you again very much. We believe thank that uh, labor is extremely important uh, as uh, mentioned. Everything is in flux, is it not? And we need one another. None of us are strong. No group is strong enough at this point to take power elite, which is uh, certainly extremely strong, but at the same time paradoxical, as weak as it has ever been. Because what is going on today politically, economically, ecologically, and socially is simply unsustainable. There is something new that's going to happen, have to happen, that is more just, robust, and sustainable, and democratic. And that's where we come in. And we've got to be together doing it. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Good night. Greg, Linda. Good night, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. Bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>